Hey, good morning, PCBC family. I'm so excited uh, to welcome Noel Boucher this morning to bring our message as we look at God's seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now, we're going to broaden this to the topic of sexual purity, and Noel is the perfect one to come and speak. He's a great friend to our church, has one of the most important ministries of our time at Pure Hope. Uh, their team is all about providing biblical Christian solutions in our sexualized culture, and they bring about transformation by pointing people to Jesus, who is the author of our purity. So this afternoon, starting at 1.30, up in the loft, just upstairs from here, is an opportunity for parents to come back and have an interactive time of conversation with Noel. You will not regret this time spent being encouraged in your role of raising your kids to understand that Jesus loves them so greatly that he wants to protect them from the darkness of our sexual culture and also that he is the one who can help them stay pure by recognizing temptation, understanding that there are those who would seek to steal their innocence. So we'll provide care and activities this afternoon for your kids from birth to sixth grade. And at your discretion, 7th through 12th graders are invited to attend the discussion. If I had 7th through 12th grade, I'd, I'd have them there with me. It will be a great time with Noel, and you're not going to regret coming. Now, all you need to do is come and check in at the Commons at 1.15. Uh, we'll get started at 1.30, and we'll be done by 3 o'clock. So right now, it's my great joy to welcome Noel Boucher. Let's give him a warm PCVC welcome. Ooh. Hey, good morning, everybody. Man, that was awesome and unexpected. That, that we could just leave right now, I think. There's a little sermonette from Pastor Jeff. He's obviously left, conveniently, <laughs> on the week about sex. Hmm. Um, no, it's awesome. He's, uh, Jeff has become an incredible, incredible friend. Super excited to be here. And I wasn't expecting that, though. I did think that Mel Brooks and Charlton Heston were going to be introducing me. Um, so he just blew up my entire intro, so I'll have to find some more one-liners as we go. I, I did get to check the uh, bucket list of sharing the stage with Jack O'Pierce, though, or at least half of Jack O'Pierce, so uh, we're making progress already today. But real quick, uh, intro, my name is Noel Boucher, wonderful to be here, uh, have been here before. Last year we were here with our, our ministry, Pure Hope, doing a conference here with Josh McDowell, so we love the deepening relationship here with your community. I, I know a number of you, many friends out in the crowd, and uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, what, what we think the Lord is doing right now quickly about me. I uh, live here in the Metroplex in the Mid-Cities with my wife, Dr. Vanessa Boucher, who's here. Uh, we have uh, just hit our 18th anniversary. We are best friends, partners in justice, as we like to say. But uh, as you can imagine, if you're married, 18 years means uh, a lot of highs and a lot of lows, too. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit in terms of love, how we love and, and what marriage is and, and why God says so much about it, why he cares so much about it, why there's this command in these Ten Commandments that we're going to talk about today. We have two daughters, ten and seven, so we're a happy family of four. Uh, I am not only the only male, but the only introvert, so you can pray for me. Um, it it uh, is great. We've had some time this year to get away. Hope all of you have had some good travels. We did a road trip, and there's no better way to get on each other's nerves, I mean bond, than a road trip. We actually did like four states. It was a civil rights-themed tour. Vanessa put it together. It was amazing, timely for us, and really... Uh, really increased, I think, us as a family, and then we were gone for the fourth, too. We went to Disney. It was a very generous uh, extended family vacation. I uh, had fun. Um, I do want to quote Jim Gaffigan, though, and say, going to Disney in July as an adult, it's not like standing in line at the DMV <laughs> on the surface of the sun, and that's what we're doing. Now, the other thing, this is probably too much information, but, man, I, I came back with an ear infection. And so I hear nothing out of this ear. I'm like George Bailey up here right now, and it's wonderful. I can't, so you will get more attention probably over here. Uh, I should get a t-shirt with mouse ears. I went to Disney, and all I got was swimmer's ear. Um, but it's been great. Hope you've had a great time. And then again, pure hope. Uh, Jeff, man, already introduced it really, really well, but we're all about shaping a world free of sexual exploitation and brokenness by equipping believers, by equipping especially parents and other influencers to confidently lead our families through this digital sexually exploitative age that we live in. 
That's what we're all about. We're creating resources, and I think we have some uh, visuals of that, but also we have a table outside that you can engage with. Uh, and um, go to our website at peerup.net for more resources. I'm mentioning that now, not as, a, not as a plug, but just that we make the most of this time, because that's what this team at Peer Hope, a community that extends all over the country, is all about, is equipping us to go to some places we really haven't gone, and we need to to find healing, and we're gonna go there today. But deep, deep connects here. I have friends throughout this audience, uh, thankful for so many of you. Uh, Jeff's daughter, Whitney McIntosh, who was on the stage last week, is our communications coordinator, so we got deepening connections and uh, love what's going on. I will mention Wayne and Lizzie McCullough, just because, could mention a bunch of people, but Wayne and Lizzie are fellow executive producers on the Heart of Man film which is an independent film we helped produce and give to the world last year. It's a dual genre docudrama uh, that, that really asks the question, what if our sexual brokenness was a bridge to the Father, not a barrier? And it takes the prodigal son parable, incredibly shot, incredible cinematography by our film team, weaves it together with stories of brokenness and redemption uh, from men and women around the country. And if you haven't seen it, I know many of you have or you've heard of it, Check it out. It's on Netflix, Right Now Media, and I know that Pastor Jeff is working with the team to really use the film and the participants' guide as part of where you're going this next year. That, that's what I love about Jeff. He's incredible, courageous. He's absent here today, uh, but he is leading courageously and has for decades in his ministry of helping people find deep healing, and I love that, and I love that about Wayne, too. If you haven't connected with Wayne, connect with Wayne. There, there's few people across the country I know that are ministering in the way that he is, especially to men, but to families, and love him like a brother. So let's get into the message. Um, if you're here for the first time, you can see it's a series on the Ten Commandments. Many of you have been here for the whole thing. Was really, really excited when Jeff asked us as a team and me to come bring a message uh, here on the Seventh Commandment. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to, uh, haven't been here, but I've been following the videos and have watched Jeff's messages and really, really, I've been encouraged and challenged as I'm sure many of you have. And it's given me a chance to reflect on these Ten Commandments. And so before we get into today's message, which is, again, on the Seventh Commandment, uh, I'm just going to offer to kind of build on what I think uh, Dr. Warren has done, uh, two thoughts that have struck me as we've looked at these Ten Commandments that we know so well. Um, the first one is this. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I got my hands on an Army Ranger handbook uh, through a family member. And was just looking at it. I was interested in tactics. I'm not a military I uh, have no military history myself, and so it grabbed my attention. And the first three pages of this small handbook were on leadership, and that really grabbed my attention. So I looked at it, and it focused on this concept of command and control. Now, most of us have heard that phrase, command and control. I've heard it. I didn't know what it really meant. And I did not know that they were two separate things, command and control. They're two separate things, and they have this reciprocal relationship. Command is what you want in the military, and I think as we apply it to life, in life we want to have command. We want to be able to give orders, to entrust things to people who are below us, who are our subordinates, to go out and do the mission and do the job. But here's the thing. Control is something different. As I learned, and military officers know this, that as your control increases, your command decreases. I thought, that's crazy. I thought command and control was just power. You tell people what to do and it gets done. That's, that's what it is. No. As a leader, you want to have high command, low control, because the more control you put, the less your subordinates are able to make decisions on the front lines. And that really intrigued my, my thinking on that. So I looked at it, and command actually comes from the Latin word, comandare, if you know Spanish, mandar. It means to literally entrust to. When I'm commanding you, I am entrusting you to something. I have a position that allows me to give to you something. It literally means out of my own hand. Control comes from the Latin meaning to roll against. And that just blew my mind. Because most of us have experienced some type of control in our lives, maybe a controlling parent, a controlling spouse, a controlling boss. We've experienced being controlled, a person who is controlling, and we feel like they're against us. Even if they're trying to help us, we feel like they're against us because that's what is really happening. They are contra. They are rolling against us. And as parents, that blew my mind because I want to be commanding my daughters and entrusting to them something, not controlling them and crushing their heart and their mind. And it's interesting that we have the Ten Commandments not the 10 quality controls. God has said, I'm commanding you, but what I'm really doing is entrusting something to you. I am entrusting this commandment. I'm entrusting this commandment. And that will change how we think about God. It changed how I thought about God. Because I thought, you know, he's just a cosmic killjoy in the sky. Here's 10 things we can't do. Thankfully, it's not 15. I mean, we're not from Mel Brooks. We'd really be under a burden here. <laughs> 10 commandments. Don't do, thou shalt not. 
But what he's really doing is entrusting. Are we entrusting to our children? Are we entrusting to our employees? Are we trusting them with these things? And if they mess up, guess what? Are we stepping into that mess like our God did? Are we stepping into that? Are we going to be there? Or are we going to fall back into control? And that leads to the second point that I really realize as Jeff has been teaching on this, because he mentioned this a few weeks ago with the fourth commandment. But this whole thing in the scripture that we're reading in Exodus 20, it's just a one big wedding ceremony. God is marrying himself to his people. And if you read the commentators, Jewish Christian commentators throughout the ages, they make points that are really, really cool about how this whole thing at Sinai, the people gathering, the covering over the mountain, the vows, the rights and responsibilities that are exchanged, it's a marriage. That again changes how I see God. And Pastor Jeff has been saying throughout the message this Tozer quote of what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Some of us have had controlling people around us in our lives, and we have viewed God as just another one who's trying to control us, just trying to get us to conform. If that's what we think when we think about God, that says a lot about us, and it, it probably explicates, probably explains a lot of our behaviors and a lot of our relationships. But what if this God, what if starts to come into our mind today when we think about God is someone who is entrusting to us something because he believes in us, loves us, is putting vows around it to be intimate with us and to stay and be steadfast and faithful with us. And if something does happen, he steps right down into it and walks with us. What if that's what we think about when we think about God? I think that's, that's game changing. And that takes us to the message on the seventh commandment. That's why we have a big red 10 right here. We're talking about the 10 commandments. This is the seventh. And you can turn to Exodus 20:14 if you want. It's only five words, so I mean, don't spend a lot of time. Exodus 20:14, you shall not commit adultery in the English Standard Version. You shall not commit adultery. Bam. It's kind of like Pastor Jeff said last week with you shall not murder. We can, okay, done. Let's go to lunch. Got it. No problem. But there's so much more to here unpack, just like he did last week with murder. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. And the Hebrew is interesting. Hebrew is such a different language. And I'm not a scholar, but it really struck me as I was looking at the Hebrew. It's even less than that. Like, shall, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I like to say I'm a recovering lawyer now. I have, I'm doing well in my recovery. I have some friends in the room who are, I'm trying to help them into recovery. Uh, but shall is a tough word. There's a lot of litigation around the word shall. And so I'm not a big fan of it in the English. In the Hebrew, it really looks more like no adultery. It's kind of like just no adultery. And, and if this is a wedding ceremony, if God, as Jeff has mentioned, is a God who is a, not just king and not just lord and not just shepherd, but a, a, a lover, a passionate lover, a spouse, a consort, a partner with us, then this makes a lot of sense that the seventh commandment would be, hey, no adultery. Just no adultery. Now, what does that mean? It's not just because I'm a lawyer. It's because theologians, we have to do theological work saying, okay, what about adultery? What is it? Why? Why is it here? Its position is interesting. It's right after murder, as you went through the sixth commandment last week. It's right before, spoiler alert, next week, thou shalt not steal. So why is it there? Why? That's interesting. It's not quite murder. It's not quite killing. Maybe it's a little more than stealing. I don't know. I think we'll see that there's some elements of that as we go through it. Uh, what does it mean? Man, the first day of law school, I was in constitutional law, and the first exercise in, as they say, thinking like a lawyer, uh, which is a blessing and a curse, uh, was an exercise on the Ten Commandments and specifically on this verse. I was like, what? Man, don't I get enough of this elsewhere? Now in con law, I got to listen to a professor talk to me about, about the Bible? And, and he said, look, thou shalt not commit adultery seems pretty clear. Five words. But what does it really mean? Uh, I mean, who does it apply to, first of all? Does it apply to everyone? Does it apply to men, women? That was, a, that's, I think, even in our day, a question we have to ask. But in the ancient world, that was a good question. We see examples in the Bible of biblical figures who are living in a complete double standard. Woman, we have one patriarch of the faith that says, burn her at the, at the stake because she's been immoral. While he's been immoral at the same time, double standards. But does it apply to everyone? I don't What, what kinds of sexual activity does it include? Is it, is it just monogamy, polygamy throughout the Bible? Uh, bestiality, sacred sexual rights, masturbation. Now, a quick note here. We're going to use a few words today that are tough words for some of us until we just get our minds around the fact that they're real. They're real subjects. They're real things that we engage with, and everything we talk about is in the Bible somewhere. 
We're not just throwing slang around. Everything is in the Bible. Every concept we're going to talk about is in the Bible. We need to know the Bible, and we need to speak it. Now, my children, who are 10 and 7, where where do you guys end up? They're they're in the room right now, so maybe that will give you some comfort. Maybe it will just show you how weird our family is. Um, But there's a reason for that. Because scripturally, we see it. Joshua, when they came into the land, it says they opened the book of the law, all of Moses' law, the Ten Commandments, and they read it to all the people, men, women, and little children. And there's a lot of stuff, including the topic of sex, in that law. And everyone heard it. Because if you don't hear it, you're not going to know what to do with it when it bumps up against you, and it will find you. Ignorance is no protection of innocence. So that's where we're going here. We're, you know, but, but again, what does it include? All of those? It's another reason to to go deeper and really look at this verse. What what does the word adultery even mean in English? We'll look at that. And why adultery in the Ten Commandments? I mean, there's only ten. Thanks to Mel Brooks. There's only ten. Oy vey. There's only ten. Why? Why not go big, God? I mean, adultery? I mean, why not rape? Why not something really big? Criminal, sexual violence. Why this? I think we'll find out as we look at the text. Now, um, the big thing and a reason for this approach, an approach we're going to go into here in a second, is Pastor Jeff's trilogy that he has laid out throughout the series, which is that the precept has behind it a principle, and behind that is a person. And this person is this God who has made himself manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. The precept shows us some principles. As Pastor Jeff has laid out, every, every principle within that, there is protection and there's provision. Don't do that because... It will provide something and it will protect against other things. And behind that is a person. Not just an abstraction, but a person who wants relationship. It is why we take wedding vows. It is why, as G.K. Chesterton said, when we're in love, we so so tend to make promises when we're we're, just falling in love. I will love you forever. I will never. We're just prone to that. It's out of love and affection. And this is what we see happening here. Now, the message could focus on the harms of the wrong. So we could say, okay, you know, don't commit adultery. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to talk about why it's so bad and scare all of us to death and we can walk away. Now, a lot of us have had that. That's how I grew up. I heard a lot of thou shalt nots and here's why. Because you'll get this, catch that. This will happen, that will happen. And those are real. Those are real consequences. That's one way to approach it. It's one side of the coin. It's not the full value of the coin. So instead of the harms of the wrong today in this message... We really want to focus on the hope of the redemption, not the harms of the wrong, but the hope of the redemption, because that is what's happening here. I mean, we could stay in Scripture and just go down a list of how not only relevant it is, but scary it is. I mean, just look at characters in the Bible, Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, promiscuity, polygamy, Lot and his daughters, incest, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, polygamy, all this adulterous, Shechem and Dina, Judah, Tamar, prostitution, incest, Samson, King David, Amnon, Tamar, sexual violence, King Solomon. And then, of course, in the New Testament, it's more just straight didactic teaching, which we could bang over our heads, instead of the narrative of the Old Testament where we see these stories. But we want to focus on why God is saying to us, don't do this, but if it happens, I will step in to this thing that I have commanded, I've entrusted to you. It really jumped out at me when I was looking at all these names, of all these stories that we know. And we might kind of brush over how explicit they are and how much pain families destroyed and lives and murder and nations over decades and centuries even falling apart because of adultery. But many of the same names I just mentioned show up in the genealogy of Jesus, this Messiah who is literally our salvation. So maybe we need to look at this verse. Maybe we need to look at this commandment and say, is there something more here that we've missed? So if, if, if adultery has something to do with salvation, it got me thinking, what, you know, what text as I was preparing? We've been praying for you for months since Jeff uh, started the series and invited us, but as I've been praying about the message, I thought, where do we want to go? You know, I only got five words to work with in Exodus 2014, so what should be our main text? And if this is about salvation, my mind got drawn, boom, like laser focus, to one book of the Bible, that is literally titled Salvation. It's the book of Hosea, which is a man's name in Hebrew, means salvation. There must be something there that shows us something about salvation. Oh, and by the way, most of the book is about adultery. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this text, and if you want, you can go to Hosea 2, 
But what I'm going to do is read some select verses out of that whole chapter for the sake of time and also to get us focused on the major things here for this, this message. Uh, so I would recommend, flip to Hosea 2 if you want, but, but close your eyes or just listen as I read the text, and then I'm going to move into a quick prayer, and then we'll unpack this a little bit. It's Hosea chapter 2. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Plead that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. For their mother has played the whore. She, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and water and wool and flax and oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge her up, hedge her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her pass. And she did not know that it was I, this is God speaking to his people through the prophet, it was I, says God, that was a side note and then I lost my spot, that comforted her, that built her, that brought her. I gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold. They have used it for their idols, for their bales. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of all her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. But, therefore, behold, I will allure her, and I will bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards, and make the valley of Akor, literally the valley of trouble, I will make it a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. No longer will you call me my Baal, my Lord, my idol. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this time of worship where you have inhabited our praises. Thank you for your word, which is your living word, which will not return to you void. And I just pray right now that in our time together, this short time together, you will speak to us, you will challenge us in places we need to be challenged. You'll comfort us in places that we need to be comforted. And we will walk out knowing you more and loving one another more. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So that's Hosea chapter 2. And what do we know about Hosea? Let's unpack a little bit what's going on here because that's going to help us apply it to our own lives, especially as we look at the culture that he was living in and the culture that we're living in today. We know just a few things, actually, from the book. It's a short book, 14 chapters. We know that he lived in the 8th century B.C., so he probably started his prophetic ministry around 750 B.C. or so. We know that he was married to a woman named Gomer and that they had three children. Uh, we know that he spoke prophetically to the northern kingdom of Israel, and this was a period of, of peace and prosperity, at least at the start, for the northern kingdom of Israel. So real quick, we have to look at some world history to kind of understand this. So if you remember in, your, in, in, in history, there's Egypt, of course. The people are brought out. They get the Ten Commandments. This is the ceremony, these commandments. The people are going to be God's representative. And he brings them ultimately into the land and ultimately puts a king over them. There's King Saul, and then there's King David and King Solomon. After King Solomon, related to this very subject we're talking about, because of moral breakdown, marital breakdown, there is crisis in the nation. In fact, there's a civil war. And after many years of fighting, the kingdom of Israel becomes two kingdoms. And there's the northern kingdom of Israel, which is in Samaria. It's also called Samaria. Uh, and the southern kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem will be in the southern kingdom. And they had been fighting. And, and they had been wasting resources and lives. And it was treacherous and it was bloody. It was a very sad time. But it, eventually there was peace made. And it's this time that, that Hosea kind of comes on the scene. There's some peace now. Some of the big empires that are coming haven't risen up yet, Assyria, Babylon, Persia. So there's peace, there's some wealth, there's some expansion in the northern kingdom of Israel of the borders. And with that peace and prosperity comes, unfortunately, some promiscuity. And the, the prophet starts, again, speaking for God to the people with not personal so much as political and economic. He says in, in chapter seven, the people in the northern kingdom, they do not return to the Lord their God. They don't seek him. 
For all Ephraim, another name for the kingdom, is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. They were making alliances with the nations around them. And, by the way, if we know the ancient world, with their cultures and their gods, their pantheons. And they were making alliances where they were making some big, big compromises. This one God who had married himself to them, they were forsaking. And they were doing it for economic gain, for political security. And they were finding, hey, this is kind of working. We'll go worship your Baals. We'll, we'll do that. Oh, and by the way, with that, it's fun. It's a good time, man. Boy, worshiping Baal is a good time. There's a lot going on here. It's loud, raucous. There's drinking. There's other things going on. They, they were orgies. That's, that's, what they, that's what these pagan rites were. In fact, I think it's the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> I read something this week, and it said, these pagan festivals and, and the worship services, there was raucous and loud singing and dancing and intoxication, etc." And the commentator said, that's giving etc." quite a workout. <laughs> <laughs> because it was debauchery. And it was everything that we see in the Ten Commandments, everything we see in the Scripture, specifically around the ethical rules around sex, were just obliterated in these other cultures, and that was happening here. There was political and economic promiscuity, and that trickled down into the people's lifestyle, into the culture, and they weren't any longer set apart. And we see this in chapter four. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, for a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. Your daughters play the whore, your brides commit adultery, but guess what, says God? I'm not gonna punish your daughters when they play the whore. I'm not gonna punish your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves, go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. And a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Everyone was lumped in. Everyone was a part of this. Everyone was being infected by the culture around them and their own sinful proclivities. They were unfaithful. But right in the midst of that, we see some amazing things from God. This God who like, if you think of God as this commander who's just like gonna squash you, if you really think God is just controlling you, then what comes next? You know, it's mind blowing. It blows that whole thing up. Because he says, even though your love is like a morning cloud, you're just, you're here and there. You whisper, some, you whisper kindness to me and then you flee and you're unfaithful. It's, it's like the dew that goes away early. Yet I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. I desire you, that you know me, knowledge of God, rather than these burnt offerings. That's where Hosea was. So we know he's married. We know he's there in the 8th century BC. He's in this place that is really prosperous, but fallen apart morally, culturally, familially, socially, and he sees things on the horizon. But here's something else we know about Hosea from the text. His wife was unfaithful to him his wife was unfaithful to him and committed adultery. And that opens up so much of our understanding of Hosea. Because he's saying some crazy things. Crazy. I mean, no other nation had a God like this who would use terms like this, marriage, wedding. I mean, the gods were kind of out there. I mean, most, most cultures, pagan cultures, most systems, they're, they're very deistic. They're like just out there and just don't tick them off. Do some things that will, you know, make them uh, think kindly about you and bring rain. But they weren't connected to the people. Most, most pagan deities were connected to the land. Here's a God who says, I want you. I want to know you. I want you to know me. I and my people are one. Totally different. And he's using language like adultery. Even this word knowledge of God, which he ends with, is like, I mean, it's almost explicit. Because the word there is da'ath Elohim in the Hebrew. It comes from yada, which, which means sexual intercourse. Not all the time. It means intellectual knowledge as well. But in many cases, in many Semitic languages and throughout Scripture, it means a sexual union. It means the intimacy of coming together. One who is different with another who is different coming together. That is what he's talking about when he's saying knowledge of God. Yada. It says in Genesis 4, Adam knew his wife. He knew Eve. And she conceived. That word is yada. And as one commentator put it, which I love, it's not just like the union. The, 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 the word actually encapsulates more than just the act. It's, it's an attachment, not just in the moment physically, but spiritually, emotionally attached. Literally, this commentator said, what it really says is Adam attached himself to his wife Eve. And that is what God is saying. I want to be attached to you, and I want you attached. 
So we don't know a whole lot about what happened with Hosea, what, how it went down, you know, what was going on. Uh, there's a lot of theories. A lot of commentators have been puzzled throughout history. I love Abraham Heschel's description of it, though. Abraham Heschel was a, a giant uh, in the 20th century, Jewish theologian and philosopher, marched with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma. And this is what he says. This is how he describes it. In the face of God's passionate love, the prophet is haunted by the scandal of Israel's desertion. And Hosea's emotional solidarity with God grows because of his own experience. And this is apparent throughout the book. For a time, he and Gomer were happy in their mutual affection. Three children were born to them, to whom Hosea gave symbolic names. But subsequently, he discovered that Gomer had been unfaithful and had given herself to many lovers. She could not remain his wife, legally, in, that, in, the, in the culture. So she then left him. She left or was legally sent away, can't quite tell. But God's way is higher than the legal way. Hosea did bring her from the slavery into which she had fallen. The marriage was renewed. God cannot abandon Israel. He cannot abandon his people. He will not forsake her in spite of her faithfulness. Hosea experienced something that wrecked him, that tore his guts out, that broke his heart, the deepest betrayal. He was a leader in, in the land of Israel, in the northern kingdom, speaking for God, and he goes through this. But what happened in it is in his sorrow and his grief, he got to know this God who would come later, manifest as this Messiah, who was a man of sorrows. And he began to feel what commentators call the divine pathos. He had a feeling for God. And because of that feeling, he could see now what was happening culturally. He didn't just see it as morally wrong. He didn't just see it as something they ought not to do, not an ethical violation, eh, but we can, we can wave it off. He said, this is adultery. You are married. And he saw it through a whole new lens. And he brought language into our discussion through a whole new lens. So this man was destroyed. Even though redemption came, he walked through the brokenness of a marriage falling apart of being betrayed, of being abandoned. And yet, because that happened, he saw God in a new way. And because he saw God in a new way, billions of people, including us here today, are seeing God in a new way. It happened 3,000 years ago. And we, even though I am sorry and this should not have happened, God is redeeming it. And that's an encouraging message for all of us. In fact, my friend Jay Stringer, who, uh, as I mentioned, the Heart of Man film is one of our partners. He's a therapist and pastor out in Seattle and doing some work with us on the film to do deeper healing coming out of the experience of watching the Heart of Man film that uh, Wayne and Lizzie and Vanessa and I and others have been so involved in. Jay has written a book titled Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. And really, the, the tagline here is when we pay attention to our unwanted sexual desires and identify the unique reasons that trigger them, the path of healing is revealed. And I love that because that goes right into what we're talking about today. It goes right into, talk, it goes right into Hosea's experience. Do not commit adultery. How can it be any more clear? People, says the prophet. And yet it happens. And he can now feel what God is feeling. And he can now see what is going to happen because God is so gracious to us and reveals to us. He always instills us with hope. We know this is gonna end well, but it's really hard right now in the valley of the shadow of death. Hosea's day was not all that much different than our day in some ways. Now, you can say, wait a second, dude. I mean, you know, come on, they didn't even have toilet paper. Let alone what. But, you know, scripture tells us two things in Ecclesiastes, the book of wisdom. It says, A, there's nothing new under the sun. And B, it says, don't ask why the former days were better than these because you're not asking wisely. It's not a direct quote, but it's basically what it says. Anytime we sit here and say, man, <sighs> just want it the way it used to be. Not asking wisely. We don't control that. We're here now. Things are changing and that's the only constant in life. So as we look at Hosea's day, we see prostitution everywhere and it's sanctioned, it's accepted, it's, and everyone's being involved in it. And what is prostitution? It's commercial sex. It's taking what is covenantal here, where God says, I'm gonna make a covenant with you, which means forever, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and I'm gonna give you rights, and you're gonna have responsibilities, and the same thing here. Commercial sex is just transactional. Just as, hey, bing, bang, boom, wham, bam, you know, the rest. It's just a transaction, doesn't mean anything. No meaning, no personhood. But 
We see the same thing today. I mean, the largest porn site hosts 81 million visitors each day. Pornography simply means, in the Greek, depictions of prostitution. Prostitution is rife. Exploitation is rife all around us. There's nothing new under the sun. But the intensity does shift. The intensity does shift. I think there's two ways the intensity is shifting for us right now. One is distraction, and the other is transaction. We are so distracted. So distracted. Everything around us is distracting us. And the word distraction literally means to pull apart. When I'm distracted, I'm being pulled apart from something. And we are distracted. We could go so many places. I mean, you used to not leave your village, most people in the world, you know, throughout the thousands of years of history. Now, I know we got families right here I talked to before, and kids flying and driving around the world, around the country. We're so mobile, distracted. We have this, distracted. It's pulling us apart from a place that we ought to be. And this has been commented on throughout our culture over the last few years. It's also transactional, not covenantal. When we make a covenant, we are saying, I'm with you. And I accept what's going to happen. And we're going to change. Things are going to change because we do change. But I'm going to change with you. We're going to grow. We're going to love. Not, hey, if I'm not getting the right ROI here, I'm out. This is too hard. I, I sh- I'm, I'm putting in more than I'm getting out. That's transactional. So how do we respond to that? How do we respond to a world where not all that much is new under the sun from the world Hosea was living in? Well, at Pure Hope, we have two main principles that I think this is really going to help us as we walk out of here today. The first one is this. First principle is that sex is about identity before activity. Sex is about identity before activity. That's game-changing because when we say the word sex, we usually think activity. And that's why we blush because we think, oh, that thing or that thing I've done or that thing that could happen or that thing... We think activity, but that's not what it's about. It's about identity. And where does that come from? It comes from Scripture. Genesis 1, the first page of the Bible is the first description of sex. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is what sex is. That's why my birth certificate, your birth certificate says male or female, under the word sex. Literally comes from the Latin, meaning to divide in two. Human race, divide it in two. One, we bear the same image of God, but we are male or female. And when that identity is strong, there is activity that can flow out of that in the covenantal union between a man and a woman. Genesis chapter 2, second page of the Bible. First discussion of sexual activity in this covenantal relationship, which brings life, which brings joy, which brings protection. But what happens is that gets messed up and brought back around. Activity comes in and messes up our identity. And if you can join us at 1.30 tonight for the, or this afternoon for the session, we'll talk more about that, especially how our children are facing a world where it's thrusting activity and that's affecting identity. If, if you have been sexually abused, and many of us in this room have, have experienced sexual abuse, that's activity that was thrust upon you, and that mars our identity. I'm impure. I'll never be pure. I, I, I'm not a beloved daughter. I'm, I'm dirty. I'm, I'm, I, I, how can I have been sexually abused as a boy? It mars our identity. Adultery especially mars our identity. In the Heart of Man film, two couple, uh, couple shares their stories, this trailer in Melody Lavorne. I want to read this because this is so powerful on this thing about adultery. Ad- adultery. Trailer says, I had a secret before with porn. That was one thing, though. Now, after infidelity, the secret became enormous. It was suffocating. It becomes this slippery slope that nothing is sacred because when the pain gets to a certain point, it's whatever it takes to get that next fix. And I kept going back to this. I couldn't understand myself how I could keep going back to this and doing this. What was so fundamentally broken in me that I could not receive all the good things God had given me? What is broken in me? That's identity. Who am I? Am I loved? Do I have place? His wife Mel says on the opposite end of being betrayed, it is overwhelming. It's really hard to feel safe when that person who's supposed to be safest is no longer safe. Who can you trust? Where can I go? And the biggest thing is, why? Why am I not enough? Our identity is shaken. And that's what adultery does. But here's the second principle that we believe at Pure Help. Purity is about relationship, not accomplishment. And again, where do we find that? In Scripture. 1 John 3, 3 says that all those who hope in Him, this God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, manifests Himself on the mountain, manifests Himself in this small town in Judea, years, thousands of years later, and came down and died on a cross, this same God says, when you hope in me, I will purify you. I will purify you and love you. That's what Titus 2 says. It says he came down to a mountain first and to a cross second 
to purify us. He came to purify us and change us. And it is in our relationship with Him. It is in a marriage with Him that is restored and renewed no matter what we've done that changes us and heals us. So how do we walk out of here and apply this? We take these two principles of pure hope, that sex is about identity first before activity and that purity is a relationship, not an accomplishment. And we say we live a pure life, a pure life rooted in the work of the cross and defined by prayer, understanding, resolve and engagement. Not just a life of avoidance, not just thou shalt not, but engaging with the one who loves us, engaging with one another, confessing our sins, opening up because the secrets are killing us. Interesting that sex and secret come from the same Latin word. It means to divide. When we're carrying secrets that we have never shared, we are living a divided life. We're two-minded, we're double-minded. Our heart is not whole. We can't have courage when our heart's divided. Courage literally means wholeheartedness. How do we get out of that? We break the power of the secret in our lives. We confess our sins one to another, James 5, so we can be healed. We confess our sins to this Lord because he's faithful and just to forgive us, 1 John 1, 9. And we don't let fear and guilt and shame keep us locked in. We step out of that. As many of us have been hurt, we think we've lost it, we've broken it, we're forever doomed. Purity for us was defined as an accomplishment, and so I didn't accomplish it. I did that thing. That thing happened to me. I didn't hit the mark. Never be pure again. That's not what Scripture says. Our pursuit of sexual identity is walking fully in our maleness and femaleness, without secrets, coming to this God who forgives us and redeems us and betrothes us in justice, righteousness, love and faithfulness, and incredible mercy. That's the invitation today. That's the invitation for us to walk out saying, maybe this God is not this controlling, patriarchal figure I thought. Maybe he is a passionate lover, as well as a friend, as well as a shepherd, as well as a potter, as well as a king, as well as a Lord. Maybe I can come back. Maybe I can come and come in my heart to this place on the cross where God gave a wedding ring went through hell to redeem us and lead us to a marriage that is coming in the end. But all of us are implicated. As Jeff said last week, man, change in this message. I haven't murdered anyone, but boy, I've said, Rocco, you fool, and I've committed murder in my heart. Jesus said the same thing. If you've lusted after someone, if you've turned someone who bears the image of God into an object for your pleasure, even just up here, you've committed adultery much would lump all of us in. So as we close here today, I hope that what is coming out of it for you is as we pray, one, a challenge. Where do I need to break the power of the secret? We like to tell parents we're either leaving a, a legacy of brokenness or a legacy of redemption, but no one's leaving a legacy of perfection to their children. Let's leave a legacy of redemption. Let's create an ongoing dialogue. Let's talk about our own failures. Let's talk about the real issues that are out there that they're bumping up against every single day. Let's figure out how to talk about it so we can build intimacy. Let's do that at 1.30. I invite you to come. But as we close here in prayer, let's just let the Holy Spirit search us. We're all responding differently to this message. It's not going to return to him void. And I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the families here. I was on the stage last year with, with Josh McDowell, like we mentioned, and the fruit of that is immense. And now to be able to be back at Pastor Jeff's invitation to see you all, what happens here can change a city and change the world. But to do that, we're going to have to come. And as Hosea 14 says, come to him. And by his help, return to him. So let me pray along those lines. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you that you are a father. Thank you that you're king and a ruler. Thank you you protect us. Thank you you're a friend. Thank you your Lord who's going to reign and rule. Thank you for being a shepherd. But thank you that you passionately love us. And thank you that even though you have said, don't commit adultery, 
you now say to us, I will heal your adultery. We thank you. And we pray, I pray for us as we go out, fill us with your spirit so that we can run into your arms and embrace you in a new way today. Thank you in the name and the power and the authority of Jesus.